together and gather together. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, whether it's a full house or it's intimate, it doesn't matter because when we gather together, Jesus is here. Right? He promises where two or three are gathered, there I am. Right? And so when we gather and we worship like that, I just love being in the presence of Jesus and getting to see all of your lovely faces. Um, just know that uh, throughout the week, uh, your pastors, we carry you in our hearts. We are praying for you. Um, and I know that there are, there are many needs um, that are represented here. And we, we are with you. And uh, we serve a God who is able. Amen. He's also willing. Because that's the other side of the same coin. He's not only able, but he is willing. Um, I want to share with you what's going to end up being this week and next week. It was only going to be one, one message, but there was just too much that I felt like God wanted me to share. And so instead of having you sit here for an hour and a half while I work my way through what I felt like God has for our church family, I thought, you know what, we'll just take two weeks. So I'm going to share part one today, and then we'll share part two uh, next week. At the beginning of October, I felt Holy Spirit begin to speak to me about our church and the season that we were in and moving into. And I had been praying through some things that I had, was seeing in our church family, and that I was carrying in prayer some of the things that, that, that Renee and some other key leaders were sharing with me about what they felt like God was saying to them in, in this time. And I felt like there was a change, there was a shift in what God was doing, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And as I was sitting with the Lord on this and praying for our church, I felt Him lead me to John chapter 15. So if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there now. We're going we're gonna to look at, at verses 1 through 11 of John 15. And here Jesus teaches about the vine and the branches. And as I was reading this and sitting with him, he spoke to me and he gave me a clear picture of our season and what he's doing in our church. And not just, not just in our, our church, kind of like the, the corporate church, you know, when we say like, oh, where are you going Sunday morning? I'm going to church. But, but in us as a, as a people, I feel like what I'm about to share with you this week and next week is what I feel like he's doing in me as your pastor what he's doing in our pastoral staff, and what I believe that he's doing in you at this time. See, because the, the church, the church is people. The church is not buildings. The church is not programs. But it is us. It is people. As we gather together in community, that is the church. And many times what Jesus is doing in us as a whole, as a, as, as a larger church family, is the collection of what he's doing in us as individuals, as what he's doing in, in the leadership, as what he's doing in me as your pastor. Now listen, this might not be the same for everyone. You might listen to these, these next couple messages and think, well, that's not where I'm at. That's okay, but my sense is that there is more than just a few of us that are experiencing this same season. So let's look at this passage, and I want to share with you what Holy Spirit's been speaking to me. Starting in verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser or farmer. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, so that it may, it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and they cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you, and abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come and that you would rest upon us as the spirit of wisdom and revelation. 
that we might know and understand and encounter Jesus in a greater way. I pray that you would, you would empower me and enable me to take what I am sensing in my spirit and to effectively communicate that to our church family today. And that we would fully embrace the season that we are in, in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus is the vine, and the Father is the farmer or the vine dresser. You and I, we're the branches. We are connected to and we are growing out of the vine, again, which is Jesus. Now the goal and the, the purpose of branches is to grow fruit. The vine produces branches, and the branches produce fruit. So as I read through this passage in the first, um, first five verses, Jesus speaks about three different levels of fruit. In verse 2, he, he mentions two of them. He says that there is fruit, that there, and there is more fruit. And then in verse 5, he says there is much fruit. See, the Father is looking for us not just to, to grow fruit in our lives, but to increase in, the, in that fruit. See, there is a growth process for us as individuals, uh, individual followers of Jesus, and for us as the church. We are to be ever-growing, always increasing, growing and maturing. We are to have ever-increasing fruitfulness in our lives. We are not to become stuck. We are not to become stagnant and just like, okay, I've been walking with Jesus for a while now. I'm happy with where I am, and this is, this is just where I'm going to stay. Jesus says, no, don't, don't, don't stay there, but there's more for you. The Father's plan for each and every one of us is to have that much fruit, that abundant fruit in our lives. So this begs the question as we read through this passage, what on earth is fruit? Like literally, what are we talking about here? Because when we just say like fruit and more fruit and, and much fruit, it's very theoretical. It's, it's all kind of conceptual. So like, what are we talking about? This is how my brain works. When I read through things like this, I'm like, okay, great. He wants us to have fruit and more fruit and much fruit. What on earth is fruit? What am I supposed to be growing in my life? What are we talking about here? See, I, I don't like things that it's difficult that, like, that I can't wrap my hands around and be like, okay, this is what we're doing. This is what we're talking about. I like to talk about that stuff up here, but, but at some point we have to, what I like to say is, we have to be able to put handles on it and bring it down so that we can actually apply it to our lives because we can sit around all day and talk about, wow, I've got fruit and you've got fruit and it looks like you've got much fruit. Nobody knows what we're talking about. I don't actually have fruits. I'm a, I'm a person. I don't grow fruit. So what's, what's, the, what, what's the connection here? It's a huge part of understanding about what Jesus is looking for in our lives is knowing what fruit is. And I believe that we can also ask this question. What does success look like? How do, how do we know if we are successful as a church? Is it how many people that we have coming? So if there's 500 people in this room Right now, would we be successful as a church? Is that what God's looking for? Is God looking for us to have all of these different programs and all of these different ministries and have all the stuff going on and, and big, big Christmas extravaganza, you know, with, with choirs and children's programs and, and all kinds of, is, is that, if, if we had all that, would we, then would we be successful? What about, what about me? What about, what about my life? How do I know what's success in my life? If what I'm working towards as a follower of Jesus, if that's even what God wants out of my life. These are important questions to ask. Or the next thing you know, we get to the end of our lives and we realize, I did it wrong. I didn't do anything that God really wanted me to do. I just did a bunch of stuff. See, as a church and as, as individuals, we can aim for a target and we can hit the bullseye all day long, every day. But if it's the wrong target, it doesn't matter. We have to aim for and hit the right things. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to get to the end of my life and have Jesus say, man, I didn't ask you to do any of those things. <laughs> what were you doing at church? Like with, with the church, I, that's not what I wanted you to do. So what is fruit? What is success in the eyes of Jesus? I believe that we can, we can list, there's a, there's a lot of things that we can list. I'm like, okay, this is success in the eyes of Jesus. But I believe you can, we can sum it up 
in, in two words, and it'll, it'll encompass all of those things. God is looking for us to be faithful and obedient. That is fruit. That is success. Are we being faithful to Jesus? Are we staying connected to him? See, in the passage, Jesus calls this abiding, having, the, having, having his life flow into our life and through us, right? Because a branch cannot survive if it's not connected to the vine. And that's, that's the picture of us. We are to be faithfully connected to the life of Jesus, him flowing in us and through us. Am I faithful to the purpose and to the call of God upon my life? What he has specifically asked me to do. What he has specifically asked you to do. Am I faithful to do the things that he's asked of us? Am I faithful to follow him? Am I faithful to a church community? Am I faithful, being faithful to grow and to mature? Am I growing up in the Lord? Or am I still, you know, like, like, am I still like in middle school? Am I still a, a, a toddler before the Lord, even though I've been walking with him for 20 years? Like, like at, so, at some point... We have to grow up. Are we faithful? See, this is faithfulness. And are we being obedient? Am I being obedient to the scripture? And not dumbing it down to the things that I want to do. And the things that I agree with. But am I, am I, am I obedient to the scripture in, the, in this, the, the, the full context of it? Even when I read it and it's that's, ouch, that hurts. I'm not living up to that. I don't agree with that. I don't like that. Because listen, if, you, if you're not coming across any of those situations when you read your Bible, you need to read more of the Bible. Because I will guarantee that you're going to come across some things when you read it, you're going to say, ouch, that hurts. Ouch, I'm not doing that. I don't agree with that. But am I being obedient to the scripture? Am I also being obedient to his voice? To what he speaks to me, to us, in a, in a moment. Do I love? Do I really love people? Do I forgive? See, this is, this is obedience. Jesus is looking for faithfulness and obedience. That's it. That's the fruit that he's looking for. This is success in the eyes of Jesus. I sat on a, uh, Renee and I sat on a, on a, on a, Zoom, on a Zoom call with, with uh, Banning Leapshire, who's the pastor of Jesus Culture in Sacramento. And he said this during the call. He said, if Jesus isn't going to ask you about it in eternity, then it's not important in his eyes. And I think we really have to frame our lives that way. Because there's a lot of things that we think are important, and then at the end of our lives, when we look him in the face, he's not going to ask us about it. Jesus, look at the big house that I had. Look at all the stuff. Look at all the stuff that I bought. I had this great job. I, 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 made, I made lots of money. Look at, the, look at the big family that I had. Look at, all this, look at all this stuff. But Jesus, look at all the friends that I made. I had so many friends. I was a friend to everybody. But, but look, look, look at the adventures that I went on. Look at all the fun that I had. I explored the incredible creation that you, that you gave to us. Look at all this. Jesus, look at how many people came to our church. Look at how many people came to our, our Easter services or, or our Christmas Eve service. Look at the people, Jesus. They loved my sermons. That's where you're supposed to say amen. It's okay. <laughs> If this, was, if this was the internet, that's what they call clickbait. <laughs> that's amen bait. Look at how busy I was. Look at all the programs and, and all the things that we did and we started. Look, Jesus. But then to have him look at us and look at me and say, but were you faithful to the purpose and the call that I put upon your life? Were you faithful to give me all of your life? Not just this piece over here or, or this piece over here, but this, this, this here I'm keeping for me. Were you faithful to give it all? Were you obedient to me? Were you obedient to my word? See, these are the things that matter. That's success. That's fruit. That's what Jesus is going to ask you about. In verse 2, 
we read this. It's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting statement. Jesus says, every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, depending on what translation you read, it'll say take away, or it might say he lifts up. See, the, the, the farmer like, passes through the, the rows of, 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 of vines, of, of grapevines, and he, and he looks and he sees branches that are, that are growing along the ground at the, at the bottom of the vine. And they're growing along the ground. And they're covered with dirt and, and grime. And, and, and they're just weighed down. And the farmer looks at those. And, and, and this is still, it's still got life. It's still got health in it. And the farmer bends down and he, and he lifts that branch up. And he's careful not to break it. He's careful not to damage it. Because if you break it, it might not survive. And so he lifts that branch up. And what the farmer does is he lifts it up and he ties it to another, to another branch. To a branch that's healthy. To a branch that's growing in the right direction. And then he cleans it off. He cleans off all the dirt and the grime from the, from the ground so that it can get sun. It can get the nutrients. See, the, the farmer just doesn't look at a healthy branch and be like, well, that's growing along the ground. I'm just going to cut that one off. Like the branch is too valuable just to cut off because it's not growing in the right direction. There's still life there. There's still possibility that that, that branch can grow fruit. This is a picture of the love and the mercy of the Father who is working with us. When we're not bearing fruit, when we're not faithful, when we're not obedient. And he's giving us every opportunity to be healthy. He's giving us every opportunity to grow fruit in our lives. It would be such a waste. I mean, and this is, this is not how God, this is not how the Father treats us. But it would be such a waste just to be like, well, that believer over there, they're not doing very much. We're just going to cut them off. and <laughs> Churches would be a lot less full than what they are now. You're right. If the father just was like, we're just going to cut that one off. They've just been sitting around. They, they've been sat in that seat for three years. They haven't done anything. You're done. You know, like he, that's, not how he, that's not how he treats us. We're the branches. There's too much value in the branch for that. Just because it's headed in the wrong direction. But full of love, he reaches towards our lives and he gently lifts us up careful not to damage us careful not to wound us careful not to break us does it kind of sound a little bit like jesus right a bruised that scripture goes a bruised reed he will not break the smoldering wick he will not snuff out like he's so gentle with us cleaning off the dirt and the grime of life from our lives and then he brings it alongside a branch. He brings it alongside another follower of Jesus. And he binds them together so that the fruitful branch can support the one that's not bearing fruit yet. That's the one that's not growing in the right direction. This is us. This is, this is the church. This is what we're supposed to look like. We support one another as the Father brings people into our lives and as the Father brings people into our church family that are struggling and they're not bearing fruit. Maybe they're, they're growing, they're not growing in the right direction and they're, they're covered with the, the dirt and the grime of life and it's just weighing them down and he ties them up to us. And he says, here, help them out. Walk with them. Do life with them. Support them. Don't just cut them off. Too often in the past as a church and as a church as a, as a whole, and yes, sometimes our church, we've rejected this responsibility and really this privilege of walking with people. Because it's not just my responsibility to walk with people. I don't know if you realize that. Like, it's not just my responsibility. It's our responsibility. I, 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 like, I want to be able to stand up here and say, do what, I, do what you see me doing. Don't just do what I'm saying, but do what you see me doing. See my life? Like, do these things. Walk with people. Love on people. Carry their burdens. Help them out. But I believe things are shifting. I believe that things are, are changing because I, I don't, that's not what I see anymore. I see people walking with one another, helping one another, reaching out. I believe we're functioning better as a church family, one that supports one another. We don't always get it right. But when we get it right, it's really beautiful. Right? We walk with one another. We love one another. We are getting better. You know, as I, as I read through this passage and sat with the Lord, he showed me 
that we've grown fruit as a church, that we're healthy, that we have been faithful and we have been obedient. And the reward of fruitfulness is pruning. See, when we're faithful, when we're, when we're fruitful, and we're faithful and obedient, we're healthy, we're maturing, we're growing, then the Father looks at us and he says, I see you. I see what you're doing with, with, with your life. I see how you're, you're applying yourself. I see how you're, you're healthy and you're growing fruit. Now let's, now let's set you up for more. How can we grow more fruit in your life? How can I lead you into greater fruitfulness? How can I lead you into greater faithfulness and obedience? It says in verse 2, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. When we're fruitful, when we're faithful, and we are obedient, the Father rewards us by cutting back the unnecessary fluff of our lives so that we can be even more fruitful. Pruning isn't a bad thing. Pruning is a reward. This is, we, we need to make sure that we fully understand this. Pruning is not the discipline of God. When you're being pruned, you are, not, you are not doing something wrong. You are not being disciplined of the Lord. It's not because, oh man, I've got the, these sins and these things that I'm struggling with, and so, oh, he's pruning me. No. No one looks at, like, you'll be disciplined. Yes, the Father will discipline you, right? But discipline isn't a reward. Like, I, I never once... When my children did something that was wrong, you know, where they, they, they told a lie or, or whatever, they disobeyed me. Did, did I ever sit them down and was like, all right, time for your reward. It's discipline time. Like, that's weird, right? Discipline is not a reward. Discipline is necessary for correction when we've got things in our lives that go against Scripture. But that's not pruning. Because Jesus says every branch that bears fruit... He prunes. Fruit is the goal. Fruit is success in the eyes of Jesus. Sin is not success in the eyes of Jesus. That's discipline. This is pruning. This is a reward. Pruning. See, when a grapevine is pruned, the vine dresser cuts it back and it, it, it cuts back the little offshoots that grow off the branches and, and, and a lot of the leaves. And, the, and it's like, really, it's the, it's the fluff. If you've ever looked at a, at a grapevine that's been pruned, you're like, is that even alive? Like, seriously, you're looking at it going, that is like the ugliest plant I have ever seen, right? But, but, the, but the farmer knows what it's doing. Right? The vine dresser knows what it's doing. It's cutting back all the fluff, all the excess stuff that doesn't help the, the, the branch grow fruit. Right? It's all the stuff. Actually, what it does, the fluff takes away and prevents the branch from growing fruit. See, the purpose of the grapevine is to produce grapes. If there's no grapes, then the vine isn't fulfilling its purpose. As followers of Jesus, we are to produce fruit. We are to be faithful and obedient. And this is the season I believe that we are in as a church. I believe that we are in a season of pruning, of cutting back some of the, the excess growth and the fluff, because he's setting us up for greater fruitfulness. He's setting us up for greater success in his eyes, to be faithful and to be obedient. The Father sees our fruit. He sees the health of our church and the work that we have done. And the reward is pruning. The reward is cutting back the fluff. Now listen, just because it's a reward... We can be real. Doesn't mean it's always fun. <laughs> I'm not going to stand here and tell you that pruning. Woohoo! No. I, I, if that's, I mean, that's that's a supernatural gift of joy. If you're like pruning, woohoo! Because <laughs> pruning's not always enjoyable, but it is a reward. Okay. It's the taking away of the things in my life. It's the taking away of the things in our church that might look good but have no fruit. See, it feels like you're being stripped bare, like you're being cut all the way back. And it, it, can, it can feel like discipline, but don't get them confused. We need to remind ourselves that the Father is pleased with us. He sees our fruit, and He sees what could be. And now He's removing the fluff so that you and I and us together as a church, that we can grow into the, to the fullness of what He has for us. Because he's got a great future for each and every one of us. He's got incredible things for us to do. And so he's setting us up to step into those things. We're not being punished, we're being rewarded. Now again, 
I don't know about you, but pruning sounds a little theoretical to me because I don't understand well, like, what, what exactly is being pruned out of my life. My brain wants to know what does this look like? What's being pruned? What's being removed? How do I know if I'm being pruned? I want to go through a few things that I feel like Holy Spirit has, has just kind of, you know, um, spotlighted or highlighted to me. It's not an exhaustive list by any means. I just feel like these are some of the things that he said, this is what I'm doing in me and in us as a church family. He's removing distraction from our lives. These are the things in our lives that will pull our focus and our attention away from Jesus. Like we, we are to have that, um, that, that the statement from 2 Chronicles chapter 20 where King Jehoshaphat says, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And that, that's, that's, that's supposed to be our, our focus. Our eyes are on Jesus. So what are the things in, in my life that are pulling that are pulling that attention, that are pulling that focus away from the eyes of Jesus? What are sometimes the, the, the sparkly things on the side that we're like, ooh, what's that? And you're like, oh, that's sparkly and nice, or, you know, that looks really... So what are these things when we're, we are supposed to have our eyes fixed firmly upon Jesus that pulls our attention and our focus away from that? That's distracting us. Listen, these things might not be bad. They might not be wrong, but they fill up our lives, and they have no eternal value. So it, it could be things like this. It could be activities. It could be hobbies. It could be entertainment. You know, like movies, TV shows, gaming, social media. Not all th these things aren't necessarily bad. But but if they're pulling our focus and our distraction away from Jesus, and He's putting His finger on them, that's how you know you're being pruned. It might even it might even be a relationship. Sometimes we've got. We've got relationships, we've got friendships, and these friendships consume. They're, they're what we would probably call toxic. These toxic relationships and friendships that they just, they are always pulling, they're always draining. They're not, they, they, don't, they don't push us towards Jesus, they don't encourage us in our walk with the Lord, but they're always pulling away from us. They're those toxic type things. We might have to end some of those relationships, set up good boundaries, healthy boundaries. So what are the things in your life that distract you from Jesus because that's what he's going to prune away. Pruning is also removing busyness because the goal is not to be busy. And I think sometimes we forget that. The goal is not to be busy. Jesus isn't looking to make you busy. He wants to make you fruitful. And they're not always the same thing. Busyness is, generally speaking, is a lot of activity, but not a lot of productivity. You're just busy doing a lot of stuff. But it's not the, the eternal value stuff. I'd actually like to suggest that Jesus wants to make you less busy, not more busy. I never want to, to be, as your pastor, I never want to be like, hey, Jesus, ha, Jesus loves you, and we have a wonderful plan for your life. Pull out your, your calendar, because we're about to fill up your schedule with, with like church stuff. Right? That's, that's, that's not the goal. The goal isn't more busy. It's probably less busy. Where you have more downtime. You have a less full schedule. You have a less full calendar. You've got spaces and gaps on there where I don't have anything planned. Because what this does is it leaves room for Him. Have you ever had a divine interruption in your day? That really train wrecked your entire day because you had all of these things that you needed to get done? Like, I, like... That's me. That's me all, that's me like a lot. Like I've got this, it's, it's, I don't always write lists down, but I've got this list in my head. And if I, if I don't like get something accomplished, you can ask Renee. Sometimes I'll come home at the end of the day and I'll, I'll sit and I'm like, man, I worked all day. But I don't, I don't know what I did. <laughs> like I didn't, I didn't finish something. I did, wasn't able to go like check that project is done. Right? And, so, and then sometimes there's the divine interruption in my day, and, and then it makes me kind of panic. Like, what, I, I, I got to meet with this, with this person who's, who's got this, this thing, and, and, but what about all my things that I've got to get done? It's because I'm so busy. It makes space for quiet time. It makes space for solitude. I know that's not a popular thing in our day and age, solitude. We don't really have many opportunities for solitude. And solitude can actually be, can actually be quite uh, frightening. 
honest, if you really get away and you are alone and there's, there's no noise, it can be really um, unsettling, solitude. But Jesus wants to meet you there. He wants you to meditate, to, to read the scripture and, and just roll it over in your mind and your spirit. That's, that's meditation. So you can hear his voice and then you can do the things that he's asking you to do. Right, Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42 tell us the story of Jesus who's at Martha and Mary's house. And he's there and, and Martha is busy in the house. She's busy preparing food. She's making sure everybody's looked after. She's cleaning up. She's doing the dishes. She's got all the stuff and, and she's like buzzing around the house and, and she sees, out of the corner of her eye, she sees Mary. She's just, she's just sitting there at the feet of Jesus. She's not doing anything. And she's, the busy people see people who are sitting there not doing anything and, the, and they get very upset, right? We, we're, we don't like them that are sitting there not doing anything and so we're even more busy. And that probably she got like busy in, in Mary's space. So if Mary's just sitting there doing stuff, she'd be over here. She's like, don't mind me, Mary. I'm just cleaning this up. I'm just sorting this. I'm just getting them food. And so she's probably in Mary's space, right? Because Mary's not doing anything. And, and Martha's like, so finally, Martha kind of boils over. And she goes over to Jesus. And she says, Jesus, can you tell her to help me? Like, all these people are here. She's not doing anything. And this is what Jesus says. Martha. Dear Martha. Sometimes I really like the Passion Translation. <laughs> Martha. Dear Martha, you're fussing too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. One thing only is essential, and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course, and it won't be taken from her. See, if my life is filled up with things that keep me busy, then I, I won't have time for the essential things. And then I'm going to be left frustrated and angry and upset and worked up. Remember, not all good things are God things. We've got to learn to stop doing every good thing that comes our way and choose to slow down and do the things that God has for us. This isn't about doing nothing, though, because if you just find yourself and you've got, like, nothing to do ever, that's, like t that's, that's taking this concept way too far on the other end. Now you're, like, dabbling in slothfulness. I'm just, like, I'm lazy. God's not saying be lazy. He's just, like, have, like don't, be, don't run yourself into the ground. Pruning is also correcting priorities like have you ever sat down and thought to yourself what's important to me and have you ever sat there and and thought to yourself what's important to jesus or or do you just maybe you just don't set priorities the thing about priorities is if you don't set them life will if you don't set priorities, your priorities, someone else will set them for you. So, and maybe, maybe, you, maybe you have set priorities and maybe they're just misguided. See, a misguided priority might be, it might, my, I just want to make as much money as I can. I just want my family to be comfortable. I want my family, I want my children to have all the things that I didn't have when I grew up. Or maybe, maybe, maybe your priority is making sure that your kids are involved in all the stuff, right? They're, they're busy. They're, you know, they've got, uh, they've got you know, martial arts and sports and after school tutoring. And then they've got the art class. And, and then they've, you know, they've got all the stuff. And so, like, you're, you're, busy, you're really just a taxi, taxiing your kids around to all of their stuff, right? That, and that's the priority. Maybe your priority is just, I just want to have as much fun in life as I possibly can. But are these really the things that are actually priority in life? Like, I don't know. Like, I've read the Bible a few times, front to back. Um, and I've never seen anywhere in there where Jesus said, have as much fun as you possibly can. <laughs> Not that we shouldn't have fun, right? I think Jesus had more fun than we, we give the Bible credit for. But that was, the fun wasn't the goal. It wasn't the priority. So th these things, is this really what's going to facilitate fruitfulness, success, faithfulness, and obedience in my life? When Jesus walked the earth, he was pulled in a million different directions. Three and a half years, he had people pulling on him constantly. 
I, I don't know if, if have, have any of you guys watched the Chosen series or like some of it? Like we started and then we gave up. It just we didn't like the first episode. I was kind of lost. I didn't understand what was happening. And then we came back to it and we're like, okay, I'm just gonna commit. And if you, once you get to about episode three, you're like, okay, now I, I understand what's happening here. And like I said, I've read the Bible, so I know the story. I mean, there's really no secrets. I kind of know how it's going to turn out, but it just didn't, I didn't catch me. But now it's, now it's got me. And so we, we're watching it, and one of the things, we watched an episode last night, and that stood out was, like, <laughs> all of the personalities of the disciples. The things when you read through the Gospels, you're not, like, we don't catch the, the, all the personalities. I mean, we know Peter was Peter, who just said whatever he thought, and he was, like, running the show. But they show the different personalities and how they interact with, with the disciples, and and, and how draining sometimes that must have been on Jesus. Like, these are, you guys, you're supposed to be helping me in ministry. You know, now you're, you're like the focus. Like, stop. There's at one point, like, they're in the, in the show, they're very concerned with Jesus' security. And so he's like, I'm going to go on a walk now because I need to be alone. And then, like, James and John stand up and like, we'll go with you. We'll be security. And he turns to me and goes, enough with the security. Like, just, guys, stop. And so he's always pulled but he never let the wants and the needs of people determine what was important. See, he said, I only do what I see my father doing, and I only say what I hear my father saying. Time and time again, you see in the Gospels how Jesus pulled away. He went away by himself to pray. There was even a time after he'd sent the disciples out to do ministry, and they came back together, and he said, let's go away by ourselves for a time to rest. Quiet, slow down. Because pruning cuts away misguided priorities. Death to self. I think this is something that we're going to wrestle with as long as we've got breath in our lungs. We're going to have this repeatedly cut out of our lives. What this is, is this is putting myself first. It's making my ideas, my preferences, my way of doing things My thoughts, it's making me the priority. This is where I'm reminded by the Father that life isn't about me. It's not all about me. It's not all about you. Listen, this is not easy. This this might be one of the hardest things that gets pruned out of our lives. Because our old nature, that, that, that part of ourselves before Jesus part, is me first. It's always me first. And it doesn't die easy and it doesn't die quickly. It honestly seems to have a thousand lives. But following Jesus is death to self. In Luke chapter 9, he says, If you desire to be my disciple, you must disown your life completely. Embrace my cross as your own and surrender to my ways. For if you choose self-sacrifice, giving up your lives for my glory, you will discover true life. This is cutting away from our lives all, this, all of those attitudes and those thoughts that put me before Jesus and me before you. It's not supposed to be that way. Because this, it, it, when, we, when we die to self, when that gets pruned out of us, he's moving us to greater levels of serving one another, greater levels of loving one another. Greater greater levels of walking with one another, bearing one another's burdens, praying for one another, preferring one another, honoring one another. When's the last time you checked in on someone else to see how they were doing? And you're just like, hey, I want to know how you are. Can we go for coffee? I just want to talk. And you don't offload and unload on them, but you're like, "How how are you? How are you doing? What, how, how is your family? Right? When's the last time you cared more about them and their situation than making sure they knew what you were walking through? And that's not saying that, that we're not walking through stuff. We all got our stuff. But it's dying to self. He's leading us to self-sacrifice and death to self. The last two that I want to just point out as I close is Control and striving. See, we're called to give up control. Even though we all want it. We all feel like we need it. We all feel like we must control everything. Whether, you know, some of us, some of us think that we're, 
we don't we don't try to control and generally you're the passive aggressive ones <laughs> and then there's those of us that that are like aggressive aggressive they just outwardly control everything and i don't it doesn't matter if you know i'm trying to control it that's my struggle but we all feel like we need to control stuff but the truth we really can't control anything i can control my thoughts my actions my words my response and my choice that's it that's all i can control so we should probably stop trying so hard to control everything and just allow jesus to cut that out of us and striving striving is where we work for things that jesus has already given us we work for his love we work for his acceptance we work for the things of the kingdom see he gave those to us you can't work for them. It, this, is, this is the thought, that, 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 uh, that attitude is, the, the more I work, the more results I'm gonna get, that I'm going to get. It's more, more. It's work harder, harder. It's effort, effort. It's push, push. It's do bigger and better. It's, and it's, it's that striving. We're trying to get through life under our own power and strength. God says, hey, it's the weak that I chose, and it's the weak that see my power in them. He wants you to know that he's already with you. The fullness of his presence is already with you. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to strive for it. He already loves you. And it doesn't matter what you do. He, he can't love you more. It, it's, it's literally one of those impossible things. God can't love you more. So you, you don't have to be super Christian. Just be you. He just wants us to come to him in faith confidence as a child as one of his chosen sons and daughters don't get me wrong we work we just don't work for things so these are some of the things that I feel like he's pruning out of me some of the things I feel like he's pruning out of our staff our pastoral staff our leadership and out of us as a church He's cutting these things back out of our lives so that we can be more fruitful. So we can truly walk in success in his eyes. And this is our job here, is to lean in. Because we can back away from those things, right? This is, it still comes back, that faithful and obedience. When we feel like he's putting his finger on something, on control or, or, or it's busyness or wrong priorities, we, can, we, can, we have two choices. We can either lean into that and allow him to say, hey, that, that's not needed. I want to remove that out of you. Let's, let's not do that anymore. Or we can pull back and we can be like, no, 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 I like that. I like my busyness. I like all the stuff that I fill my life up with. And the moment that we, the moment that we back up and we pull back is the moment we stop being fruitful. If, but as you lean in and you, you kind of lean towards that pruning, that removing out of your life, he is setting you up for greater fruitfulness. The reward of fruitfulness is pruning. So I, I know. Oh, this is a lot. And in that, in that episode, in the middle of the episode of The Chosen we watched last night, this is a father comes to Jesus and he's very concerned because his, his daughter and, a, and a, an employee are now some of his followers. And, and he's saying, you ask a lot. You ask a lot of your followers. And Jesus looked at him. And he said, I, re I require much from my followers, but those that don't follow me, I don't. And I sat there and I was like, whew. <laughs> he requires a lot out of those who follow him. But if you don't follow him, he doesn't require much from you at all. But there's really only one, one way to live. Life is found in him. Life is found in Jesus. And family, I believe that we are, we are in the process of being set up for greater fruitfulness. And listen, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying when I talk about, like, does God want, like, but look at the, look at the, like, you know, the building was full. We don't want just people here to have people here so we can say, hey, look at how good we're doing. We're looking for people to be fully engaged with Jesus. 
right? That's, that's like being discipled, right? Following the Lord, who are going all in, right? And they're not just, okay, well, I go to church on Sundays. That's, that's what I do. But come Monday, Monday to Saturday night, I live like the devil, but I'll be there on Sunday, right? It's, we are looking to see people encounter the presence of Jesus and give their lives to him. The harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. So don't hear what I'm not saying. I have an expectation of our church family that we will grow, that we will grow. That like if, if in three years we're looking around and we see all the same faces, we've missed it. We've, 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 we've missed something. We have to sit back and sit down as a family and be like, we need to reevaluate because we've done something wrong if we're just seeing all the same people or if we're just seeing people from the church down the street that we just shuffled, you know, shuffled the deck and everybody gets a new congregation, and, but it's all the same people. Like, where are the people that have never known the name of Jesus? Where are the broken? Where are the poor? Where are the lonely? Where are the hurting? Where are the hopeless? That's what we want to fill our church with. Those that... Not those who already know, but those who have no clue. That's what we want. Oh, let's stand. And this is what I want us to do. I, I just want you to, if you're like, if there's a gap between you and the person beside you, just shuffle over and put a hand on the shoulder of the person next to you. I'm, I want to pray over us as, we, as I close the message. And then uh, when I'm done praying, I'm going to have our ministry team come. And then we're going to be available to pray with you if you've got specific needs, okay? And I want you to begin to pray over the person to your right and left. And begin to pray over them that God would continue to prune them. That God would bring them into a place of fruitfulness. That they would be faithful and obedient to the call of God upon their lives. That God would raise them up for more. That God would, would use them to perform signs and wonders and miracles as they preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ through their lives and with words. Jesus, this is our church. You see it all. You know it all. And I thank you for the season of pruning that I, that I believe that we are prophetically in, how you are pruning back the things in our lives that have no eternal value. And I pray that you would highlight, even now, Holy Spirit, that you would highlight things to each one of us, areas that you are pruning, areas that you want to cut out of our lives so that we can be um, um, more fruitful that we can be more faithful, that we can be more obedient to you, that, that we would be able to accomplish all the good works that you set out before us in advance that we would do. And God, that we would walk in your ways and that you would use us to reach the lost, the hurting, the forgotten, and that we would welcome them into your kingdom, the church global, Jesus, we say yes to, your pr to the pruning of the Father. We say yes. Even though it's uncomfortable and not always enjoyable, we say yes to the reward of pruning. In Jesus' name, amen.